Hi everyone. Um, so to open up, I wanted to tell you a short story. So this summer I uh, was arguing with my brother about feminism because he's he was complaining that feminism only ever talks about issues about how women are disadvantaged. And so to prove him wrong, I decided to research and write a whole dissertation on how <laughs> masculinities are uh, like issues around masculinities in literature. So I'm looking at how male characters are objectified and sexualized in adolescent literature written by female authors and aimed at a largely girl, like female audience as well. Uh, so this is a, sh um, a part of my dissertation project where I looked at masculinities overall, but for today I'll look at objectification and the male body specifically. Um, so first of all, what is adolescent literature? So some people call it young adult literature or YA. I will probably be saying YA from now on because that's easier. So we all know the Hunger Games, Twilight, maybe you know the Maze Runner or the Mortal Instruments, but all of these are examples of YA film adaptations of very popular books. Um, so YA is a genre that um, spans, uh, that bridges the gap from children's literature to adult literature and it's aimed at an audience of usually like 13 to 18. 18 year old children. Um, and also, uh, it's so YA, it spans all of different genres as well. So there's contemporary YA, there's fantasy YA, and science fiction YA. And for today, I'll be talking about fantasy specifically because I'm looking at how masculinity is portrayed in non human characters. So thinking like in Twilight as vampires, obviously, in the case of the book I'll be talking about, it's fae, fairy characters. Um, so YA is also very important right now because it's very much a genre that is growing. So as we see here from about say 400 YA novels published per year, 30 years ago it went up to 7,000 and that's from, six, uh, from 2016. So um, we can just assume that there's even more books being published per year now. And as Cart says, the golden age of YA uh, promises to become a permanent fixture. So YA is incredibly important to the book industry and it will only become more important. And it's also very much a genre that's in motion. So it's constantly changing. It's very experimental and there's way more you can do within the YA genre. Uh, moving on. So today I'll be talking about this series. It's called Throne of Glass, written by Sarah J. Maas. There's eight novels, six main novels, two uh, spin-off books. And it's arguably the most popular fantasy series on the market right now. It has over half a million ratings on Goodreads, which if you don't know Goodreads, it's like a kind of like a social media for books. Um, it has many very, very dedicated fans online. If you go to like the fan bases or look at reviews um, and it's immersive fantasy. So it's all in a future, like not futuristic, but a fantasy world unlike our own. And we have a strong female protagonist, as is often the case in these novels, who's called Aelin. And then her main love interest is called Rowan, who's, as I mentioned before, is a fae. So it's like an invented species by the author, kind of like a fairy-like man. And I'll be talking a bit more, obviously, on how he's described and what he looks like later on. So I picked Sarah J. Maas specifically because she's very much a more extreme example of this issue in YA of tropes. So tropes are like repetitive plot structures and repetitive themes, kind of like motives that get reused in the books again and again. And the one that's relevant for me today, obviously, is this idea of the super masculine, super attractive male love interest for the female lead. And so in Sarah J. Maas's books, these characters are often very similar to each other and don't stand out, out as individuals, which we see here as one a uh, Reddit user is complaining about this. He says that in Throne of Glass, um, uh, it seems as though they all become the Sarah J. Maas male character cardboard cutout. They're all tall, handsome, possessive, and manly, manly men. I literally cannot differentiate any Sarah J. Maas characters anymore. So this shows the frustration that comes with having male characters that have become such a representation of a trope of this attractive love interest that they do not because uh, they stop being individual characters with their own character traits and their own in the like yeah individual traits moving on um, these are some stats on it's uh, on like a sample of 500 science fiction and fantasy books 
published in 2019, so it's not representative of all the books published last year, but it's a representative sample. So this is the breakdown of um, the gender of the author of the books. So this is for all science fiction and fantasy books published in this sample that they took. And then if we look at YA, we see the gray square shifting up. So that's female authors and the blue is male authors. So we see how in YA, it's very much a female sphere. It's very much female authors writing for female readers. And yeah, so it's a gendered medium. And this is part of what feeds into this issue of how male characters are represented. Because in this perceived absence of like male readership, um, authors maybe do not care as much about representing varied masculine characters and varied masculine identi identities. Yeah, so it's very important to keep in mind. And then also talking about fantasy specifically, because I'm looking at YA fantasy. Uh, it's especially within fantasy where these issues are also exaggerated because within fantasy you don't have to stick to the responsibilities and the restrictions of realistic fiction. Like Sarah J Maas creates this invented species, so she has the right to make them whatever she wants them to be. So if she wants them to be super muscular, super attractive, that's what she can do because they don't have to be human, they don't have to be realistic, it's all fantasy. And so Taylor writes that the inclusion of the supernatural allows for the depiction of an aggressive, even monstrous masculinity, a masculinity that feminism forbade for the ordinary human male. So that's exactly my point, as in by making these characters non-human, they don't have to stick to what ordinary human males have to stick to, as in being not toxic masculine. And then she goes on to say that the otherworldliness offers a justification for behavior that is not only unacceptable for human males to exhibit, but also unacceptable for women to desire in a society that has been influenced by feminist critique of male violence. So moving on, I want to look at the actual physical descriptions we get in Sarah J. Mass's books then. So the first description is when Rowan first appears as a character, so the first time the male uh, the main protagonist sees him, she says, uh, a male, female, a fey male was prowling toward her, pure, solid fey, tall, broad-shouldered, every inch of him seemingly corded with muscle. He was a male blooded with power. So, I mean, <laughs> based on your chuckles, I can already see what you probably think of this description. Later on, she goes on to say that he was rock hard muscle encased in velvet soft skin. And that's only two examples. You get a few of these on every three pages, approximately. So she uses very much like a repetitive vocabulary. They're constantly described as solid, pure, muscular, tall, um, unyielding is another one she likes using a lot. And all of these emphasize what we would traditionally see as masculine attributes. So they're all tall, muscular, strong, and she very much exaggerates them compared to the human characters and the human males she has within her series. Um, and this again proves how she uses the non-humanness and her own invented species to have this image of hyper-masculinity. And then, um, yeah, and this again also feeds into how um, by making these characters so attractive and feeding into this trope of the sexy male love interest, this feeds into an online trend that's begun appearing of young readers discussing their favorite book boyfriends online. I don't know if you've heard about this before, but it's essentially young readers getting so attached to the fictional characters that they see them as their fictional boyfriends. And then they talk about how much they love these characters. Um, and here I also included some fan art to see how readers are perceiving these characters and how they interpret their appearance. Um, yeah, so moving on with this book boyfriend trend, publishers feed into this more and more and create more and more of these superficially attractive male characters. Uh, and this feeds into the female gaze. So essentially the male characters are created to satisfy the female gaze and have uh, like, yeah, to satisfy what female readers are maybe looking for in these books as they are very popular, so it seems to work. So uh, within the book we see, um, so this quote is of when Aileen, uh, yes, Aileen is interacting with Rowan again, and it says, she gripped him harder, savoring the corded muscle of his forearms, the eternal strength of him. 
So we again see that it's the male characters are described from a female perspective. It's the women looking at the males, appreciating their form, appreciating their bodies. And then we also have the second one, which is um, Lissandra, another female character in the series, talking about Rowan. So she hasn't met him yet, and not seen him yet, and she brought him close. And then she says, looking at our guest, I think Nazarin undersold him a good deal, so the clothes, so the clothes might be tight. Not that I'm objecting to that one bit. So here again, she's saying that she likes looking at Rowan and she doesn't mind him wearing some extra tight clothes, which again shows how he's very much objectified. He is silent in this scene, so it's all the women in the scene looking at him, appreciating his body, whereas he remains silent and only gazed at by the female characters. Um, so why does this matter? Why do we care about this? Um, thinking about how the male physique is portrayed in these books, it's uh, the image of the ideal male physique is a product of ideology and fantasy, just as images of perfect womanhood have been shown to be. So um, this again underlines that this idea of the male character that's portrayed in these books is unrealistic, fantastical and not real. And that's an issue as, first of all, for young male readers, if there are, like there's obviously not that many male readers, but for the ones that might be reading this, by establishing such a masculinity as the norm, they marginalize boys who perform masculinity in other ways. So for boy readers, there's no relatable characters. that They, they might be crushing their own ways of manifesting masculinity if this is what they see in the literature that they consume. And also for female readers, it's obviously we're talking about YA here. So it's young readers, impressionable readers who are still building their worldview. They're still building their own identities and opinions of the people around them. So if young readers are constantly confronted and surround themselves with these images of masculinity and male identity that are so stereotypical, one-sided, unvaried, that's incredibly problematic for how they build their opinions of the people around them potentially. And so inclusions of diverse masculine, uh, masculine ident identities is crucial in unsettling the norms of traditional gender representations in order to present other ways of being male for young men and women. Inclusiveness and uh, representations in YA literature is a very current topic and it's very important that we start reading these books that are often seen as entertainment literature more critically and really think about what it is that we're consuming when we read these books so we can demand better representation and inclusiveness in the future. Thank you very much.